Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Chapter 7. Of course, Constantine was much too short, but in his own way he was handsome, with light brown hair and dark blue eyes, and a lively, challenging expression. He could almost have been an American. He was so tan and had such good teeth, that I could tell straight away that he wasn't. He had what no American man I've ever met has had, and that's intuition. From the start, Constantine guessed I wasn't any protege of Mrs. Willard's. I raised an eyebrow here and dropped a dry little laugh there, and pretty soon we were both openly raking Mrs. Willard over the coals and I thought, this Constantine won't mind if I'm too tall and don't know enough languages and haven't been to Europe. He'll see through all that stuff to what I really am. Constantine drove me to the UN in his old green convertible with cracked, comfortable brown leather seats in the top down. He told me his tan came from playing tennis, and when we were sitting there side by side, flying down the streets in the open sun, he took my hand and squeezed it, and I felt happier than I had been since I was about nine and running along the hot white beaches of my father the summer before he died. And while Constantine and I sat in one of those hush, plush auditoriums in the UN, next to a stern, muscular Russian girl with no makeup, who was a simultaneous interpreter like Constantine, I thought how strange it had never occurred to me before that I was only purely happy until I was nine years old. After that, in spite of the Girl Scouts and the piano lessons and the watercolour lessons and the dancing lessons and the sailing camp, all of which my mother scrimped to give me, and college, with crewing in the mist before breakfast and black bottom pies and the little new firecrackers of ideas going off every day, I had never been really happy again. I stared through the Russian girl in her double-breasted grey suit, rattling off idiom after idiom in her unknowable tongue, which Constantine said was the most difficult part because the Russians didn't have the same idioms as our idioms. And I wished with all my heart I could crawl into her and spend the rest of my life barking out one idiom after another. It mightn't make me any happier, but it would be one more little pebble of efficiency amongst all other pebbles. Then Constantine and the Russian girl interpreter and the whole bunch of black and white and yellow men arguing down there behind their labelled microphones seemed to move off at a distance. I saw their mouths going up and down without a sound, as if they were sitting on the deck of a departing ship, stranding me in the middle of a huge silence. I started adding up all the things I couldn't do. I began with cooking. My grandmother and my mother were such good cooks that I left everything to them. They were always trying to teach me one dish or another, but I would just look on and say, Yes, yes, I see. Well, the instructions slid through my head like water, and then I'd always spoil what I did so nobody would ask me to do it again. I remember Jodie, my best and only girlfriend at college in my freshman year, making me scrambled eggs at her house one morning. They tasted unusual, and when I asked her if she put in anything extra, she said cheese and garlic salt. I asked who told her to do that, and she said nobody, she just thought it up. But then, she was practical and a sociology major. I didn't know shorthand either. This meant I couldn't get a good job after college. My mother kept telling me nobody wanted a plain English major. But an English major who knew shorthand was something else again. Everybody would want her. She would be in demand amongst all the up-and-coming young men, and she would transcribe letter after thrilling letter. The trouble was, I hated the idea of serving men in any way. I wanted to dictate my own thrilling letters. Besides, those little shorthand symbols in the book my mother showed me seemed just as bad as let T equal time and let S equal the total distance. My list grew longer. I was a terrible dancer. I couldn't carry a tune. I had no sense of balance, and when we had to walk down a narrow board with our hands out and a book in our heads in gym class, I always fell over. I couldn't ride a horse or ski, the two things I wanted to do most because they cost too much money. I couldn't speak German or read Hebrew or write Chinese. I didn't even know where most of the old, out-of-the-way countries the UN men in front of me represented fitted in on the map. For the first time in my life, sitting there in the soundproof heart of the UN building, between Constantine, who could play tennis as well as simultaneously interpret, and the Russian girl who knew so many idioms. I felt dreadfully inadequate. The trouble was, I had been inadequate all along. I simply hadn't thought about it. The one thing I was good at was winning scholarships and prizes, and that era was coming to an end. I felt like a racehorse in a world without racetracks or a champion college footballer suddenly confronted by Wall Street in a business suit, his days of glory shrunk to a little gold cup on his mantle with a date engraved on it like the date on a tombstone. 
I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband, and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was E.G. the amazing editor, and another fig was Europe and Africa and South America, and another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila, and a pack of other lovers of queer names and offbeat professions, and another fig was an Olympic lady crew champion, and beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself, sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which those figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest, and, as I sat there unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and, one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Constantine's restaurant smelled of herbs and spices and sour cream. All the time I had been in New York, I never found such a restaurant. I only found those heavenly hamburger places, where they serve giant hamburgers and soup of the day, and four kinds of fancy cake at a very clean counter facing a long, glary mirror. To reach this restaurant, we had to climb down seven dimly lit steps into a sort of cellar. Travel posters plastered the smoke-dark walls, like so many pictures, windows overlooking Swiss lakes and Japanese mountains and African velds, and thick, dusty bottle candles that seemed for centuries to have wept their coloured waxes red over blue over green and a fine, three-dimensional lace, cast a circle of light around each table where the faces floated, flushed and flame-like themselves. I don't know what I ate, but I found immensely better after the first mouthful. It occurred to me that my vision of the fig tree and all the fat figs that withered and fell to earth might well have arisen from the profound void of an empty stomach. Constantine kept refilling our glasses with a sweet Greek wine that tasted of pine bark, and I found myself telling him how I was going to learn German and go to Europe and be a war correspondent like Maggie Higgins. I felt so fine by the time he came to the yogurt and strawberry jam that I decided I would let Constantine seduce me. Ever since Buddy Willard had told me about that waitress, I had been thinking I ought to go out and sleep with somebody myself. Sleeping with Buddy wouldn't count, though, because he would still be one person ahead of me. It would have to be somebody else. The only boy I ever actually discussed going to bed with was a bitter, hawk-nosed southerner from Yale, who came to college one weekend only to find his date had eloped with a taxi driver the day before. As the girl had lived in my house, and I was the only one home that particular night, it was my job to cheer him up. At the local coffee shop, hunched in one of those secretive, high-backed booths with hundreds of people's names gouged into the wood, we drank cup after cup of black coffee and talked frankly about sex. This boy, his name was Eric, said he thought it disgusting the way all the girls in my college stood around on the porches under the lights and in the bushes in plain view, necking madly before the one o'clock curfew so everybody passing by could see them. A million years of evolution, Eric said bitterly. And what are we? Animals. Then Eric told me how he had slept with his first woman. He went to a southern prep school that specialised in building all-round gentlemen, and by the time he graduated, it was an unwritten rule that you had to have known a woman. Known in the biblical sense, Eric said. So one Saturday, Eric and a few of his classmates took a bus into the nearest city and visited a notorious whorehouse. Eric's whore hadn't even taken off her dress. She was a fat, middle-aged woman with dyed red hair, and suspiciously thick lips and rat-coloured skin, and she wouldn't turn off the light, so he had had her under a fly-spotted 25-watt bulb, and it was nothing like it was cracked up to be. It was boring as going to the toilet. I said, maybe if he loved a woman, it wouldn't seem so boring. But Eric said it would be spoiled by thinking this woman too was just an animal like the rest, so if he loved anybody, he would never go to bed with her. He'd go to a whore if he had to, and keep the woman he loved free of all that dirty business. It had crossed my mind at the time that Eric might be a good person to go to bed with, since he'd already done it, and unlike the usual runner boys, didn't seem dirty-minded or silly when he talked about it. But then Eric wrote me a letter saying he thought he might really be able to love me. I was so intelligent and cynical, and yet had a such kind face, surprisingly like his older sister's. So I knew it was no use. I was the type he would never go to bed with, and wrote him I was unfortunately about to marry a childhood sweetheart. The more I thought about it, the better I liked the idea of being seduced by a simultaneous interpreter in New York City. 
Constantine seemed mature and considerate in every way. There were no people I knew he would want to brag to about it, the way college boys bragged about sleeping with girls in the backs of cars to their roommates or their friends on the basketball team. And there would be a pleasant irony in sleeping with a man Mrs. Willard had introduced me to, as if she were, in a roundabout way, to blame for it. When Constantine asked if I would like to come up to his apartment to hear some balalaika records, I smiled to myself. My mother had always told me, never under any circumstances, to go with a man to a man's rooms after an evening out. It could mean only one thing. I'm very fond of balalaika music, I said. Constantine's room had a balcony, and the balcony overlooked the river, and we could hear the hooing of the tugs down in the darkness. I felt moved and tender, and perfectly certain about what I was going to do. I knew I might have a baby, but that thought hung far and dim in the distance and didn't trouble me at all. There was no 100% way to not have a baby, it said in an article my mother cut out of the Reader's Digest and mailed to me at college. This article was written by a married woman lawyer with children and called in defence of chastity. It gave all the reasons a girl shouldn't sleep with anybody but her husband, and then, only after they were married. The main point of the article was that a man's world is different from a woman's world, and a man's emotions are different from a woman's emotions, and only marriage can bring the two worlds and the two different sets of emotions together properly. My mother said this was something a girl didn't know about till it was too late, so she had to take the advice of people who were already experts, like a married woman. This woman lawyer said the best men wanted to be pure for their wives, and even if they weren't pure, they wanted to be the ones to teach their wives about sex. Of course, they would try to persuade a girl to have sex and say they would marry her later, but as soon as she gave in, they would lose all respect for her and start saying that if she did that with them, she would do that with other men, and they would end up by making her life miserable. The woman finished her article by saying, Better be safe than sorry, and besides... There was no sure way of not getting stuck for a baby, and then you'd really be in a pickle. Now, the one thing this article didn't seem to me to consider was how a girl felt. It might be nice to be pure and then to marry a pure man, but what if he suddenly confessed he wasn't pure after we were married, the way Buddy Willard had? I couldn't stand the idea of a woman having to have a single pure life, and a man being able to have a double life, one pure and one not. Finally, I decided that if it was so difficult to find a red-blooded, intelligent man who was still pure by the time he was 21, I might as well forget about staying pure myself and marry somebody who wasn't pure either. Then, when he started to make my life miserable, I could make his miserable as well. When I was 19, pureness was the great issue. Instead of the world being divided up into Catholics and Protestants, or Republicans and Democrats, or white men and black men, or even men and women, I saw the world divided into people who had slept with somebody and people who hadn't, and this seemed the only really significant difference between one person and another. I thought a spectacular change would come over me the day I crossed the boundary line. I thought it would be the way I'd feel if I ever visited Europe. I'd come home, and if I looked closely into the mirror, I'd be able to make out a little white alp at the back of my eye. Now, I thought that if I looked into the mirror tomorrow, I'd see a doll-sized Constantine sitting in my eye and smiling out of me. Well, for about an hour we lounged in Constantine's balcony in two separate slingback chairs, with a Victrola playing and the Balalaika record stacked between us. A faint milky light diffused from the street lights, or the half moon, or the cars, or the stars. I couldn't tell what. But apart from holding my hand, Constantine showed no desire to seduce me whatsoever. I asked if he were engaged or had any special girlfriend, thinking maybe that's what was the matter, but he said no. He made a point of keeping clear of such attachments. At last, I felt a powerful drowsiness drifting through my veins from all the pine bark wine I had drunk. I think I'll go in and lie down, I said. I strolled casually into the bedroom and stooped over to nudge off my shoes. The clean bed bobbed before me like a safe boat. I stretched full length and shut my eyes. Then I heard Constantine sigh and come in from the balcony. One by one his shoes clonked into the floor and he lay down by my side. I looked at him secretly from under a fall of hair. He was lying on his back, his hands under his head, staring at the ceiling. The starched white sleeves of his shirt rolled up to the elbows, glimmered airily in the half-dark, and his tanned skin seemed almost black. I thought he must be the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. I thought, if only I had a keen, shapely bone structure to my face, or could discuss politics shrewdly, or was a famous writer Constantine might find me interesting enough to sleep with. 
and that I wondered if as soon as he came to like me he would sink into ordinariness, and if as soon as he came to love me I would find fault after fault, the way I did with Buddy Willard and the boys before him. The same thing happened over and over. I would catch sight of some flawless man off in the distance, but as soon as he moved closer I immediately saw he wouldn't do at all. That's one of the reasons I never wanted to get married. The last thing I wanted was infinite security and to be the place an arrow shoots off from. I wanted change and excitement and to shoot off in all directions myself, like the coloured arrows from a 4th of July rocket. I woke to the sound of rain. It was pitch dark. After a while I deciphered the faint outlines of an unfamiliar window. Every so often a beam of light appeared out of thin air, traversed the wall like a ghostly exploratory finger, and slid off into nothing again. Then I heard the sound of somebody breathing. At first I thought it was only myself, and that I was lying in the dark in my hotel room after being poisoned. I held my breath, but the breathing kept on. A green eye glowed on the bed beside me. It was divided into quarters like a compass. I reached out slowly and dosed my hand on it. I lifted it up. With it came an arm, heavy as a dead man's, but warm with sleep. Constantine's watch said three o'clock. He was lying in his shirt and trousers and stocking feet, just as I had left him when I dropped asleep, and as my eyes grew used to the darkness I made out his pale eyelids and a straight nose and his tolerant, shapely mouth, but they seemed insubstantial as if drawn on fog. For a few minutes I leaned over, studying him. I had never fallen asleep beside a man before. I tried to imagine what it would be like if Constantine were my husband. It would mean getting up at seven and cooking him eggs and bacon and toast and coffee, and dawdling about in my nightgown and curlers after he'd left for work to wash up the dirty plates and make the bed, and then when he came home after a lively, fascinating day, he'd expect a big dinner, and I'd spend the evening washing up even more dirty plates till I fell into bed, utterly exhausted. This seemed a dreary and wasted life for a girl with fifteen years of straight A's, but I knew that's what marriage was like because cook and clean and wash was just what Buddy Willard's mother did from morning till night, and she was the wife of a university professor and had been a private school teacher herself. Once, when I visited Buddy, I found Mrs. Willard braiding a rug out of strips of wool from Mr. Willard's old suits. She'd spent weeks on that rug, and I had admired the tweedy browns and greens and blues patterning the braid. But after Mrs. Willard was through, instead of hanging the rug on the wall the way I would have done, She put it down in place of her kitchen mat, and in a few days it was soiled and dull, and indistinguishable from any mat you could buy for under a dollar in the five and ten. And I knew that in spite of all the roses and kisses and restaurant dinners a man showered on a woman before he married her, what he secretly wanted when the wedding service ended was for her to flatten out underneath his feet like Mrs. Willard's kitchen mat. Hadn't my own mother told me that as soon as she and my father left Reno on their honeymoon— my father had been married before, so he needed a divorce. My father said to her, Phew, that's a relief. Now we can stop pretending and be ourselves. And from that day on, my mother never had a minute's peace. I also remembered Buddy Willard saying in a sinister, knowing way that after I had children I would feel differently. I wouldn't want to write poems any more. So I began to think maybe it was true that when you were married and had children it was like being brainwashed, and afterward you went about numb as a slave in some private totalitarian state. As I stared down at Constantine, the way you stared down at a bright, unattainable pebble at the bottom of a deep well, his eyelids shifted and he looked through me, and his eyes were full of love. I watched dumbly as a shutter of recognition clicked across a blur of tenderness, and the wide pupils went glossy and depthless as patent leather. Constantine sat up, yawning. What time is it? Three, I said in a flat voice. I better go home. I have to be at work first thing in the morning. I'll drive you. As we sat back to back at our separate sides of the bed, fumbling with our shoes in the horrid, cheerful white light of the bed lamp, I sensed Constantine turn around. Is your hair always like that? Like what? He didn't answer, but reached over and put his hand at the root of my hair and ran his fingers out slowly to the tip ends like a comb. A little electric shock flared through me and I sat quite still. Ever since I was small, I loved feeling somebody comb my hair. It made me go all sleepy and peaceful. I know what it is, Constantine said. We just washed it. And he bent to lace up his tennis shoes. An hour later, I lay in my hotel bed, listening to the rain. It didn't even sound like rain. It sounded like a tap running. The ache in the middle of my left shin bone came to life, 
and I abandoned any hope of sleep before seven, when my radio alarm clock would rouse me with its hearty renderings of Sousa. Every time it rained, the old leg break seemed to remember itself, and what it remembered was a dull hurt. Then I thought, Buddy Willard made me break that leg. Then I thought, No, I broke it myself. I broke it on purpose to pay myself back for being such a heel.'